I'll call then City Development and Planning together. Um, the first item on the agenda is whether we want to do a resolution for Chef's Appreciation Day. Are we all going out for dinner after this? That's right, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't have anything against it. Can you just kind of tell me where this, you know? It's a parent. It's uh, August 16th, Chefs Against Cancer, and it honors all chefs on the third Saturday of August each year. So there's a, a national pink tie organization, it's a 501c3, and um, it bands men together in the support of, of to fight against cancer, wear a pink or fuchsia tie nationwide to raise awareness nationwide. Uh, and then this is specifically for their chefs division, and it goes across all the professions, but they have over 400,000 chefs, and it's rapidly growing worldwide. So um, what I was going to propose this evening is if we find out if we have local chefs that, that we pass at Hinging, we have local chefs in our area that participate, hmm. I was going to reach out if nobody else had um, and see who is active in their division around here. This is certainly a good, a good thing to heighten awareness sure. to, you know, good causes like this. Okay. Any questions? No. All right. So I'll entertain a motion to approve it. Okay. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. And also a ceremonial resolution for the Polish Festival. Unless Mr. Kozier was proposing that. St. Albert. St. Albert. Madam President, I'm sorry. Mr. Kozier had called me. He witnessed an auto pedestrian accident. There's nothing else to come before city development and planning. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. Move. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Call to order government operations. Chief here. Yep. Yes. Um, we have Chief Sedgwell here to talk to us about the uh, deputy chief's position that was eliminated from the 2014 budget. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I wasn't in the position when the uh, decision was made to uh, the deputy chief's position. Um, I understand it was uh, to be revisited uh, this time uh, of the year. Um, for those of you who are aware of what the deputy chiefs do, um, we have a deputy chief that is in charge of our uh, EMS program. Um, he's in, char in charge of fire training also. We had a, a deputy chief in charge of the hazardous material program. He was also in charge of the fire investigation bureau. Uh, we had a boat program, a tactical paramedic program. Uh, we have recruiting. We have a uh, deputy chief takes care of uh, inspecting new fire apparatus and uh, new safety equipment. That's basically what our deputy chiefs and, uh, and staff do. Uh, we had two. Um, the one was taken out of the uh, EMS line. Uh, so what I've done is, uh, with, the, uh, with the assistant chief, delegated the duties, uh, some of the duties to him, and um, the hazardous material deputy chief also was in charge of uh, EMS at this point. Uh, so uh, the question is, you know, could we use the deputy chief? We, you know, I'm sure the answer is yes, obviously. Uh, I think that anybody could use my help. Everybody's very really busy. So uh, there again, I wasn't involved in the discussion. I wasn't in this position at the time. Uh, but that is basically what uh, the deputy chief position is. Two deputy chiefs are having training, if you will. Um, so at this point, uh, my deputy chief, uh, the one remaining I have, he's in charge basically of uh, the hazardous material program and the EMS program, as well as fire training. The other duties have been split up, uh, split up for the uh, assistant chief's position. So you mentioned um, of the boat program in there. Is that yes, the boat currently is not in the water due to uh, training issues. You know, we had some uh, we had some mechanical issues with it earlier in the year over the winter. 
but uh, certainly the deputy chief uh, that we, we don't have is in charge of the boat program also. Can, can you just tell us what the boat program is? Uh, we have a boat that is uh, stationed down at the river um, for uh, water emergencies, if you will. Um, we staff it. Uh, we actually don't staff. It's not staffed. It's in the water. In the event we have an emergency, uh, you know, we pull people off the apparatus uh, and send them down the river for whatever type of emergencies that you know, may occur. But uh, well, one of the deputy chiefs would be involved in uh, training and organizing that program. So obviously, <clears throat> this position is not funded in the 2014 budget. No, it's not. So uh, have you talked to Ms. DiGenova about any, how that would look financially for the rest of 2014, or? Well, uh, we haven't really discussed it in, in detail. Um, there is some money available in, in, the, uh, in the salary line, um, but overall, um, we haven't discussed it too much in detail. Questions, comments? Yes, Mr. McCurry. You said you have some uh, money in the salary line like that? Well, there's a lot of lines in the budget, but there's some, uh, some retirements, we have some money in the house. But we also are going to be hiring people. Do you know how much? I don't know how much. Well, I, I guess I wanted to say is the way that the fire department budget now projects into the latter part of 2014 is that although there will be some reduced expenses compared to budget and single lines, if you look at the department overall, I think that it probably will be over budget and overtime costs. Do you think you agree? Yes. Other questions or comments? <laughs> Um, you are you asking for this position to be um, reinstated immediately? Well, oh, let's be clear that the administration is not asking for this position to be reinstated. This is just for seeing we get okay. Would that be your desire? I guess is that what sure. you're okay. Um, so we talked about 2014. To have you? I mean, the reason it got cut out was because there was not enough money. You know, because of budgetary, so um, and, and, and um, looking at that, have you talked to our finance department like going forward what that would look like for your department? I mean, that, that's one of the reasons that it was. Um, I'm not saying it's not necessary, obviously, based on what you stated, it is. We're looking at the budget for next year currently, yes. And what kind of impact has it had not having this position? You, you described that you had to um, assign some other duties. Is this increasing overtime in those particular positions where you have to reassign duties? Uh, it's not increasing our overtime line. Uh, there again, I, I wasn't here when we had it, so we're just we're shuffling duties around. We covered other people, and uh, you know, sure, we're running a little thin. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Well, we have a lot of these duties and covers. Covered. Currently, we are. Yes, uh, it, it's not easy. I just want to be clear, you know, the city's under pressure in all the parties. People would like uh, more staffing, would like more resources, but we manage what we have. And Chief Senecal is actually compiling a fairly impressive track record in his short tenure. If you look at uh, the number of arsons, some of them are running right now, I think at 100%, maybe more than the case. Some of that is 80%. They're working together, they're using the resources that we have, and they're delivering results at a high level that the community ought to be proud of, and feel confident that the services are there when we need them. But that requires everybody to sometimes tighten their belt and work within the realities of the money that we have. Yeah, I don't think anybody's trying to, trying to suggest that the police, or excuse me, that the fire department isn't running you know, well, and that everybody's not doing a good job. Um, I think it's more that, um, you know, if we can create a stronger infrastructure for when changes do happen, like the chief retiring and things that make for um, a good, smooth transition and, you know, a good, solid, you know, support within the fire department as one of the busiest fire departments in the state. Um, a good thing, right? So, 
Um, you know, I think it's just something we should continue to look at and talk about every, you know, little bit as the council committed to when they decided not to reinstate that position. Um, because ultimately, for taxpayer, for one for one hundred thousand dollars just home, it's about four dollars a year, um, and I think that that's something that the public should weigh in on too, on whether that's of a, a value to them. Um, so I I want to keep being a squeaky wheel about it. But any other comments or questions, Mr. Rainey? Question for the chief. Sure. How has this been working so far, Chief, with this position out of the budget? How has it been working as far as you Well, we're, we're asking the existing deputy chief basically to wear two hats, and the new assistant chief is, you know, absorbing a lot of the duties. Not having to go in the water, uh, you know, take some of the duties away that we normally would have. But overall, I mean, it's been four years to fall off the wagon, I assume. Because, I mean, I have to agree with what the mayor said. We have so many department heads wearing 20 hats right now, so it's not unusual within the city of Schenectady. We have the Parks Department and maintenance, and it's all coming under one person. So I, I understand where this is all coming from, but right now with the belt tightening, you know, a lot of people are asked to do extra duties, and if they can step up to the plate and do those duties, I think that's what, but I agree, we have to keep you know, addressing this and see what new revenue may come in. Uh, if it can be afforded or not. But we have problems in a lot of departments where people are really overworked and overtaxed as far as the work that they're doing. So I'm glad to see you can keep the, everything going, you know, to which I have. And that yes. just, that speaks well of you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Other questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Chief, thank you. Thank you. Ordinance to amend Chapter 138, Commercial Property Inspections, District Group to Beer. We have put this on hold for some. Yeah, we, uh, yeah. Well, one of the cycles were called Hollow Depot this year. We approved that. Yes. And um, I'm not sure why it's on uh, today, but I just spoke with Carl and he said that he's been in the process of going out to other municipalities looking at what statutes they've got with respect to this issue, and he's working on drafting it, and as soon as he gets the final draft for uh, your final review, he will present it to me. So I would suggest you just moving this. Just to pull that part of the cycle. Two weeks. Clarity then on the uh, agenda, because we were told just to hold it for until ne next cycle. Yeah. So you're saying hold it indefinitely no, until we're told. Hold it until next cycle. That makes sense. Two, two weeks. You said Mr. Palatico was looking at it? Yes. Mr. Mutineer, can you follow up? Yes, I will, I will follow up to make sure that we have it in, in two weeks. Okay. Uh, Erie Boulevard Supplemental Agreement with the New York State Department of Transportation, Mr. Wallen. Mr. Wallen. He's coming. <laughs> <laughs> Great timing. Yeah. Yeah. Why? He watches it at his desk. We missed him. We have to trick him next time. That was perfect. No, he's up there working away. The air conditioner. Let me tell you, they really mess up the sound, though. <laughs> so, we're here to talk about the uh, Erie Boulevard Supplemental Agreement that you have in front of you. The Supplemental Agreement is uh, for additional design services and right-of-way acquisition related to the construction of the roundabout at Erie and not. Uh, all the costs are within the budget. This is just a step in the procedure. We had preliminary design. We had right-of-way incidentals. The right-of-way incidentals identified which properties, portions of properties, would need to be purchased to make the project work, which is similar to what we've had on other federal aid projects. RK Height, a right-of-way firm, was hired to uh, evaluate the properties. The properties were then uh, evaluated, paperwork was filled out, and that was the value of $48,000, which you can't get from this form, but, uh, and that is the supplemental agreement between us and the state for those services. Questions, comments? Anyone? Okay, so I'll ask for a motion to accept the agreement. I'll move. Okay, and oh, we don't have a second, so I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Very good. Congratulations, Mr. Wallen. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Before we go to something. 
Sure. Did I miss you? Sorry. No, I did not. Oh. Miss you. No, it just it isn't about this. It's oh, just about okay. initially you probably went into it too. When is Millard Street going to be paved? Because that bump there is awful. Can we just smooth that out until it's paved? Millard Street, uh, we, we can look at smoothing the bump out. Millard Street yeah. will be paved within uh, either the end of this week or the next week. Uh, we are looking to do a more of a significant improvement to Millard Street regarding the width of the street. We're, uh, we're going to narrow the street by approximately 10 feet. We're going to install a stone line ditch down the hillside of the street. And what that's going to do is pick up all that runoff because what we've been doing is working with general services because in the wintertime they complained of a severe ice buildup at the bottom of the hill. But before I did such a change, I've been talking with other consultants that I've been working with. I've been talking with other, uh, even the previous city engineer, just to try to get the history of that hillside. Uh, so that, that's why the delay is that when we come into there, you're going to see a significant change of the hillside to hopefully pick up on some of that water that's running off of it. But we can look at it just for temporarily yeah. taking because the bump traffic, even it. tonight, traffic's getting backed up onto Broadway because the people bump. stop short and it's almost, I don't know if there's been any accidents there, but people want to get up to that because it's quite a dip, yeah. especially where I'm going up. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Interest late payment tax collection, that's me. So periodically in the time that I've been on the council, we've talked about the interest rate. We've talked about the fact that, you know, where's the threshold between, you know, what's reasonable deterrent for not paying your taxes. Like we don't want to give a low interest loan to people that because they choose not to pay their taxes. But yet where's that threshold that makes it almost impossible to catch up if you get behind and so uh, you know we received an email this week from a city resident um, that i feel has quite a compelling story um, i've asked uh, the legal department um, and also mr waterfield if he could provide us with uh, a printout of payment schedule so that we can you know certainly make sure that everything is you know as reported but you know we have a hard-working person who's lived in the city 43 years who went through a tough financial time and almost can't catch up because of the percentage rate of that we're charging which we know is necessary but I just wanted to bring it up again and, and for our consideration on how we might massage that um, and what that looks like because I think, you know, it's worth revisiting. We've talked a long time. I think everybody even kind of agrees that it would be worthwhile to lower a bit. Um, so I just wanted to open that discussion again. Mr. Brady? I agree 100%, 110%. I think we have to work on well, to bring people to buy homes, well, what can we do to help people to stay in their homes that fall into a category like this? And if memory serves, this goes back to the days when our interest rate was so low and even banks were paying 4 or 5% interest on savings, well, it was incumbent on some, especially big landlords, to pay late, and they've been making more money, you know, with their money in the bank and paying the taxes. So that's why that was changed years ago. But when you went into stories like this, and if you remember right, a year or so ago, there was a fellow that didn't get his, his veterans, he was in, in the hospital, and he did the same thing. He's in a neighborhood house in the Mount Pleasant area that he grew up in, his, his house, he's 76 years old, and he fell into bad, bad time for that, like nine or 10,000. He was able to get a reverse mortgage, that's what he had to do to pay this off. Fortunately, this lady, I talked to this lady, her house is in the Canada because of the area that it's in, unfortunately, for a reverse mortgage. And the house she bought, when she was explaining it to me, it was my cousin's house. That he said, so that's why when she said when she moved from the house, I said, that has to be my cousin's house, but she told me where it was. And it, and it is. But it is a compelling story in the email that she sent. All she wants to do is stay in that house until her demise. And that's what this other fellow asked of me. And I think there's other people out there that feel this way. They're good people that I think we have to work hard to try to keep them in their homes. Because the other point she brought up, it was a great email, is who else is going to take the house, you know, at that point and maybe do as well as she is. Because she's current before, she's current afterwards. That one year she ran at the bad times. So it's, it's, it's a sad story. And she's been working very hard yes. to pay. Yeah. You know, and I think we need to do our due diligence and look at the payment structure. 
um, and make sure that everything's been, you know, adhered to. But I do think we need to look. We're in the 20s right now, right? 21%. 21. 21. 25 percent. What I would throw up for the council's consideration is, uh, can you have the prerogative for the interest in penalties? But on the just the fundamental overall policy that you might want to look at uh, a two-tiered system. So if somebody has a, a star exemption in place, they've done the paperwork showing that they're a homeowner, they live there, uh, the state has just gone through the process tightening that up to verify where there were some abuses of it. And so that those individuals be given a different rate than investors. Homeowner here, you get some consideration. And our big problem, again, are the absentee landlords, the investors, who in many cases should not be in the business. And I don't have sympathy for them in general, but understand the hardship of homeowners and how we work with that, how we facilitate people who get these uh, financial bumps in the road and we can work with them and allow them to stay there with some level of dignity and again not put it under burden on the city. Right. And, and I agree. And I think we've talked about that before, having a different rate for homeowners than we have for um, non-owner occupied homes. Um, and I think, you know, the time is now. And I think another possibility would be you know, an even lower rate grace period to to pay off what's due if that person's making regular payments. Um, so, you know, that's another thing to look at. And I, and I agree with um, that. And I also think that maybe we could look at something like if some of this seems like a one-time situation with her. If that happens to anyone, not just her, that if that one-time situation, we could just take a look at that particular, you know, their particular problem at that time. and. You know, like with DMV, if you fall if you fall behind on your, I think it's new insurance, and you get to pay off as opposed to getting the penalty of, of taking your car. Forward. You could do something like that. Like if it only happens in this time frame, though, you know, it can't happen every year, or it, maybe even every other year. But if it happens this one time, or uh, it, it could conceivably happen five or ten years later. But maybe we should be able to take a look at that and say that not that necessarily forgive the interest, but maybe a lower interest rate or something so we can catch up because. Right now, based on her email, she's not going to catch up unless she just comes into she she's going to be homeless right. at the end of the year. Unless she comes into a huge sum of money. Mr. Yeah, thank you. So currently, does the city accept partial payments for our taxes that are due? Yes. No, just say we owe 2000 we're accepting we'll 500 to we'll at least. Take so the lower that interest on the, the balance remain, Correct. be 1500 the interest on that. Uh, and I know we spoke about a few months ago, and I know if somebody, again, could just take a look at what our neighboring municipalities are charging interest rate wise and you know, take a look compare with Albany, um, Amsterdam, Troy, that's the, what they're actually currently charging and I do like the idea of a different rate for owner occupied homes um, whether or not we can follow up with that but I, I think I agree that was one, something we all talked about many months ago uh, to follow up on it just happens to be this, this heartbreaking email which I'm sure we have many other Heartbreaking cases out there as well uh, that just haven't contacted us uh, for one reason or the other. But um, I'd like to see some comparisons of what other municipalities are doing and what their rates are um, um, before we move forward anything else. Well, I think the key truly also is if the person is acting in good faith and making regular payments, mm -hmm. then it's a different, you know, kind of situation also. So. Um, is this something that the law department can work on a basic proposal in accordance to what you know other municipalities are doing? Is this something that we need to We can certainly check with other neighboring municipalities uh, and then bring the information back to you and then you can give us some parameters and then we can put together something. But uh, you know, I we'll give you the information. Okay. Just give so we'll put it on for two weeks and then who would I need to touch base with Carl, Mr. Pelletico? No, I'll take care of Okay. Okay. Um, yes. Um, and while you're looking at that, you may have suggested that we had two different rates for, you know, one for homeowners versus non-homeowners. Uh, Can you make sure that that's something that we can do? Yeah. 
I mean, I don't occupy it. I don't want to occupy it for us. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. So, I, I think the mayor's suggestion of tying it to the star, mm -hmm. you know, because there they've already gone through the process of approving home ownership. Mm -hmm. We don't need to do further checking. Is that, is that something that's acceptable there? Right? That sounds reasonable. Yeah. 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 Well, one exception. Are we making that a requirement? Because just don't forget, this is the first year that we, we had to all re-up, uh, re, uh, put the new applications for start. I just can't wait until next year when people see their tax bills and didn't do that. Um, you know, maybe we can hold off and maybe grandfather, you know, maybe we'll look at that maybe a year or two down. But I just have a funny feeling a lot of folks did not reapply for start as we all had to do. Uh, this is the first year we had to redo it. If you didn't get your phone calls yet, uh, that's usually what happens. I'll I think it's going to be a pretty small percentage. You think so? Yeah. yeah. I think they worked I, really I hard. Hope so. I hope so. And then factor in the people that actually have an issue. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but who does it require? Yeah. yeah. They would eventually get it sometime. Mr. Woodbury, yeah. you had a question? Yeah, in terms of the homestead program, I know in this particular case here, it was extended to December 31st. Do we have additional extension? No. No, we don't want. Can we look at maybe um, additional extension? If they're paying of today, they're paying on a regular basis. Um, in this case that here, same law, uh, that uh, provision is provided for in state law, so it's we can't by statute give a formal extension. But if somebody's making the payments, they're close to paying it off. They're a little bit. Skewed by time, it's within our party to have to do the foreclosure. You know? Okay. What's listed council one time, we move in the court now. And so those people we try and work with. Okay. So that's, that's what we can, we can look at it on a case by case basis. For example, I'll get one in front of us here. Yeah. If possible, not, maybe look at holding like off on foreclosure. Up, yeah, I would like to come up with something that's consistent because I think where we get into trouble is looking at things on a case-by-case -case right. basis because it's very difficult to make some of those decisions and I think that's when we have to stick to you know for the most part this is what we do um, but I think if we had a provision in there that talked about whether the person was making regular payments like for instance this person is making 2013 payments and for 2000 she was making payments for 2012 but it was going towards 2013 taxes so they're actually paid right or they will be paid but on the day she pays those off 2014 kicks in so she's still a year behind so in those respects i would like to see if there's something we can do with that period of time to assist her in catching up so that she's not always paying the year's taxes, but yet 2012 sits over here. Um, and I don't know exactly what that looks like. But That's state law. <laughs> right. Have to right. Be right. Right. Which is fine, but maybe if that's the case, you know, a lower percentage kicks in or something along those lines. If somebody's really working hard to pay that off. Um, you know. Name of refresh one. Did we make it sold to the yeah. yes. Originally, yes. Originally. But that's my understanding that was paid off. She paid that off. Yeah. yeah. To the tune of, you know, twice what it actually was to begin with. So, um, okay. Any other questions, comments? So we'll put this back on for two weeks, Mr. Thorne. <coughs> yes. Hello, <laughs> sir. We'll put this on for two weeks. No sidebars during government operations. That's where the sidebar took place. Yes. Two weeks, Mr. Thorne. Thank you. Okay. Got you in trouble. Next, water service and eviction, Mr. Fosher. Yes, I'm back in here. This is to get a full bar. Well, thank you. Well, listen, I'm just saying that to you. Now, wait a minute now. Um, thank you very much. And, and just something I just want to, again, maybe bring our committee back together. And we're talking about looking at the codes uh, again, um, trying to bring all that up to date and perhaps even uh, incorporate that into this uh, piece as well. And as I mentioned from the floor uh, last Monday, um, it just seems that we had a couple of folks, and you had the, the individual as well, but I know two folks, uh, both uh, senior citizens, both um, receiving DSS public assistance, both raising children. Uh, and water service um, notices given to them where uh, if they didn't have the um, 
sure was repaired within a reasonable amount of time. I think they gave it three or four weeks, whatever it was. They had to vacate the premises by a particular date. Um, and it was coming down to that particular date where the one woman we actually drove her down to DSS and she was able to get some assistance. But uh, she was current on her taxes in both situations, from what I understand. Both folks were current on their taxes. Uh, and we really had no other resources uh, or means to make that repair, uh, which was definitely their, their service leak. Um, as I mentioned, I, uh, the town of this unit does um, make the repairs on their own, uh, and they bill it to their taxes, um, which are included. They break it up, whatever it is, a, a, a quarterly, or even if we want to do a little bit more, we want to do for two-year cycle. Um, but the town of Rotterdam, interestingly enough, is uh, is completely different. They are responsible from the water main all the way to the curb stop itself, uh, where the homeowner only takes from the curb stop into the house. So it's it's completely different, and that to me would be very costly, I think, to the city for us to uh, be responsible for that piece um, as they do it. But uh, uh, the question I had to ask them today, uh, Mr. Clark, was uh, how many services do they repair? And he said it was it was less than 25 uh, for the entire year because we were talking about possibly doing a whole crew. Um, but he was off today. He was kind of to answer his cell phone. So he's going to be back to me tomorrow. He's going to send me an email with the total number that the town of Rotterdam has. Just a question comparisons what we're looking at here. Um, but I'd like Madam President and, and, and Chair as well to see if we can get a uh, committee of uh, three or four of us on this committee to maybe meet again with engineering, with water, uh, with Paul, uh, to take a look at that whole code, uh, maybe bring up the data, and again work with the Mayor's Office, Mr. Funk, and of course Mr. Poster, to see what we can or cannot incorporate. Uh, again, to help our residents in the city of Schenectady who uh, both were in, in need um, and they faced eviction, which uh, they had children in that. It was very, very troublesome. Um, so uh, thank goodness both of them were able to do well. But that was just my concern. If there's something we can do, we can form it, and I'd be willing to sit on that committee as well. Um, and whoever else would care to attend to that. Well, this is something that we've discussed a number of times, and I think everyone has concern with regard to this, but it's a lot to wade through. We even have mm -hmm. most of the equipment, um, but, you know, there's been a lot of discussion with regard to is it taking away business from plumbers and mm -hmm. how much does the city, you know, is the city responsible for? I can tell you as a homeowner, it scares me very much because coming up with several thousand dollars is, you know, not exactly easy. Um, but certainly uh, we can continue the conversation and try to find some sort of solution. Well, uh, Mr. LaFond is here too, so I don't know whether you yeah, are. Uh, you are. <laughs> but is there a way, can we do a committee? Does that, does that make sense? Um, I don't know what I'm looking at here. I apologize for if I'm out of order here, but. Um, yeah, obviously, there is a need to do something for some of the people who don't have the means to make these repairs. We also want to put in one of our ways to one is the point. Rather than those in the main of the curb lines, it's in the state right now. That's what we want to do. Excuse me, because you can be an alley for pounds. You can elevate the services. There's two of your services done on our scanning, but rather than on the scanning, there's a lot of your services. That's the answer to your own. The services are always still going to be done on your system. But again, I'm all for trying to help so that we can help. But how do we do it and accomplish it and take care of everybody across the board? And what are the parameters to, uh, to assist someone? Well, we want to sit down on a committee if we want to. Anybody else or who would form that? Uh, Ms. Browser or Ms. King? Because uh, they can keep talking about it, but we've got to get it done. You know, let's let's yes. have those conversations. Let's start talking. Let's sit, you know, I'm available early morning, breakfast, we love breakfast, lunchtime, whatever you got to do. Uh, but I think we really got to start getting it done instead of just bringing it to the table and saying, yeah, we're going to talk about it and just not follow up. So, um, But again, whoever needs to appoint it, um, be willing to really move on this if, if, we, if we can. Just as a point of clarification, it's not due to lack of follow. No, no, I don't. It's I want due to follow. the fact that there are so many intricacies that I don't think we've really gotten to a point where everybody or the majority even are comfortable um, with going forward. So, you know, we revisit it, but it, there's a lot of intricacies. But we can certainly open the conversation again. I think all of us would like to find a solution. Yeah, that's that's just a great question. Is it a viral exactly what you're looking for? closure but is it a possibility that if somebody has a leak like that is, can the city repair it and as Mr. Kohler brought them put it on their tax bill in installments or something like that where we're uh, right now no no it's not in the city to do such a thing it's responsible for fiction but the main it's a little confusion on the core <laughs> yeah so from the main into the house yeah. 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 Yeah
mean, could they hire the city instead of hiring the plumber and then the city gives them an installment plan? That's a possibility. Not that the city is responsible for it. The chief made a point. We're stretched for that. I think we're on our water bill is trying to draw the question on main roads and all the main things. Also, this work, unfortunately, a lot of the breaks that came this year were in the warmer weather. And warmer weather meant we got a lot of guys on vacation. That's why people, some of us have these applications for work. Our resources are stretched very thin. How do you pick and choose who gets to see who and who has to go higher the bump? Yeah, that's what I'm talking Which is kind of where we always get. We just talked about putting it on the tax bill. Yeah. So certainly it's something we'd all like to entertain. But So okay. we will sit down in small committee and uh, I will put out an email to all council members to see who's interested. And we will go forward. Perfect. Well, we'll spin our wheels backwards. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any other business to come before government operations? Motion to adjourn. Excellent. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Cool. Order of Health and Recreation. First item on the agenda is signs parking. Um, you'll find the information in your packet. Just uh, for a little background information, uh, Camille says now she came to us a couple weeks ago. The Blue Seal Neighborhood Association, as you know, the golf, there was a renovation that was up there. They're basically taking um, uh, taking charge of making sure, you know, renting the building, et cetera. Um, initially, when she came, they brought a particular fee schedule of what they'd like to see charged for, for the debate and then with the bathrooms and the indoor bathrooms and, and then using the entire facility. At the time we were discussing it, um, there was a suggestion that we have a two-tier resident versus, and a non-resident fee. And um, at that time, I, I did not, was not aware that um, Central Park already has this, but apparently in Central Park there is already is a resident non-resident. So it's something that we can do um, so without you know, changing all the legislation to make sure that all parks are the same. So what you have before you are the suggested um, fees to be charged, this resident versus non-resident, and this is what will um, happen at the, um, the public hearing. This is what will be on the public hearing for the people to look at and discuss. So, is there any questions about that or discussion or further input? Mr. Koshin. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just caught it just now. I read this thing like five, six times. The rental season. Uh, I don't believe we're keeping it open during the winter. I think we're winterizing it. If I believe, if I'm correct on that, as it, otherwise we're talking about heat and everything else for the for the facility. So I don't think it's a 12 month operation. Um, and Carl's not here. Nobody from Parks is here, right? No. Um, I'm, I'm like pretty sure we have to double check on that. Okay. I'm, yeah, I'm like 90 percent sure it's okay. not all the way. So you want the time frame? Uh, I'm okay with the time frame. Yeah. Oh yeah, the months. The months of the yes, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. That may be a typo because down below it says May from May October. Yes. Um, yes. 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 Um, right. just, I know we're going to say something that makes sense. I beg your pardon? I think there's an organizational meeting. May and true October. So we'll, we'll just double check the time frame as we be able to make sure that's correct for the uh, public hearing information. I think it's excellent. Um, uh, this cost is a four or block. Yes. That's the way it currently is at Central Park as well. And then if you look down further, if people want to stay a little bit longer, there's an additional $30 an hour. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I, again, I just want to make sure we're clear on that. So again, the, the check or the payment is only going to be made at the central administration office at the park itself. Check or, or money order from what I'm reading here. And are we going to have dedicated funds, a separate fund for the Steinmetz Park? Uh, some of what we have with those guys, or this is all going to go into the general funds? Because I think I mean, yeah. that there was a question that they wanted these fees, uh, Mr. Mayor, to go towards the restoration and the upkeep of Steinman's Park, if I recall, correct? That is correct. And they were they were specifically asking for um, an account then, so that this, trust. so that when the money trust and agency account, so the money would definitely come to the city, but an account that was designated only for Steinman's Park, so that to make sure that it just went back to Simon's Park as, as opposed to being used in all the parks throughout the city. That's not something we can consider? Yes. I'm sure you can consider it. <laughs> 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 
city maintenance, uh, the crews going over there to maintain the park, cutting grass, and so on and so forth, that we haven't figured in on this, but uh, I think it's kind of how we left it with them, is that we were hoping to set up a trust. But what do you do with the rules garden? The they, had, Did yeah, they get it all, yes. or was there a percentage that they, they kept? I thought it was a percentage. Yes, percentage. Yes, percentage. Yes, percentage. Well, they get, they get all of it, but we only advance them like 95% of what's in the account, because it's some things where we actually make refunds there, so I forget this. They're getting all the money, but there's a lag in it, so effectively we don't pay for everything. Yeah, maybe do right something up like that. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Can, we, can we look at doing something similar to the finance yeah. bar? Remember the oldest garden? That would be my suggestion. My, my recollection is, as the mayor says, the most garden money goes directly into the general fund. And then the remaining is is the most garden money that goes directly into the general fund. And then there is a point in time to look at how much revenue has been created to decide all of that rather than what are we going to transfer over to the most part of the That's my recollection. It's right to me, too. Um, so it's not, it's, 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 it
be considered too. They have big, you know, events and galas and everything else that go and you know what I mean. So some of it. You know, what is the Central Park Pavilion going to be? Is that? I just think we need to look at the structure a little bit more and whether the Rose Garden is set up. I believe mean, where they do the fundraising is maintained outside of the city's control. Oh, that doesn't yeah, help but, the, but the, the, the rental, when people are using the for weddings, and stuff for like weddings uh, photographic backdrops, gotcha. we charge a fee structure for that. That is collected by the okay. city and then transferred to the Rose Garden Committee mm -hmm. once a year or twice That's a year. That's how everything filters in the city. And the, the other consideration, um, if we yeah, this is Central Park. Is that Central Park? Um, then it's not, in this one, there's a neighborhood group that's actually working on it and you know really involved with it, making sure that it's open. So where Central Park, that happens strictly by city staff. So um, that's that you know kind of separates that from this. And they, you know they want to make sure that the work that they've done and in investing and in all of that it, it stays in a certain condition. Yeah, I'm not against it. I just need to think all the way around it. Right. It's, you know. So, I don't think we have really answered the question though, um, is, is setting up a trust agency account something that we can, that's their specific ask, so I want to make sure that ask is here, um, and make that decision so that, you know, we're clear whether that can happen or not. I'm, I'm certainly comfortable with that. I am too. Again, we're not talking much money. I think we're talking, again, like I said, 2,000 tops, and I can't imagine more than that being happening. If I may, what about the alcohol? Do we, does the city council, like we have parks or events at Central Park? Um, if you look back here. Well, it says none, but I mean, like, so does Central Park, but I know like there's, there's fundraising, so should that be in there, except by waiver of the city council? What are these special permits? Or special, should be, or how should that be? Right now, my recollection is it's at the discretion of the mayor of the application. By a not-for-profit. Only by a so should that be added in here at the discretion there, or are we okay with just going all that period? But I believe it is non-profit only. It was really just last year that we decided on that. Uh, because we were in the 11th hour getting, oh, well, we want to get married, can we have alcohol? You know, we ruin our perfect day. And so we streamlined it into at the discretion of the mayor only for Yeah. If the council wants to part of that permitting, yeah. I don't have any objection to it. No, we don't like to make you look like the bad guy. No. I know we've heard, you know, for season fundraising with them, so those folks are really very active over there, and I can see a nice gala or something happening down there where they might want to do wine or, or something to that effect. Um, so, just yeah. the thought, just the thought. Are you asking that we change the language to be the same as Central Park so that the mayor can Yeah, so it's consistent, so it's consistent, right? And they're going to be consistent, and they're going to be consistent all the time. So I think in the code, it is consistent now where it applies really citywide. Right. Mm -hmm. The only interest at this point had been in Central Park. Okay. Just you, know, you should point. just keep it back in mind is Steinmetz and Woodlawn Park are kind of evolving in similar fashion. We've got people who are actively working to raise money, do repairs there. They become uh, models. You look in Mount Pleasant, they're they're like a year behind in the evolutionary cycle where uh, Steinmetz and uh, Woodlawn are a little bit uh, ahead of it. So whatever you adapt, keep in mind that it really should be something that's applicable citywide. Mm -hmm. Even though tonight you were really talking about Steinmetz, but we put rules in place yeah. that uh, would work for everybody down the road because they don't want to have something that applies to the Elmers and something that applies to Woodlawn. And, it just becomes too hard to manage and right. really doesn't benefit anyone. Yes, I think that nonprofit designation is the way to go. Right, I agree. I still up at the mayor's discretion. The mayor's discretion. Okay. All right, so we could include um, that, that language to reflect what it says for Central Park. Yeah. Are we going to add the trust agency account? Account. Okay. Um, 
something we we're talking about again we're talking about consistency amongst all the parts and everything else so uh, i really want to again with the permission of, of the chair to uh really gather and present of course uh, to, uh really look at our park advisory committee and uh bring them up to to, to, to force and, and to task uh, and again maybe even to take a look at all our parks uh throughout the city of schenectady uh what we have what we need as the mayor was talking about capital projects possibly for 2015 of course we have to include the roof at the pavilion uh but uh you know the swing sets the equipment the playground equipment uh in standards park we have some equipment that that's just not even usable anymore right? as i'm sure jerry burrell and the others but I'd like to bring that, that committee uh, to task. I understand they haven't met in a while. Uh, there's like five or six members that are already on this committee. Well, earlier this year, it started to reconstitute. I remember. We made some appointments. There's been, I don't know if there's been a formal meeting. There's been or informal discussions. And looking to continue to staff it, uh, filling out the other positions. I've had conversations with uh, Larry Spring, in the school district's role. Again, I'm willing to continue that to look to fill those remaining vacancies and give a specific charge to go out and uh, do some analysis of what the park's needs are, put in place some long term planning for capital investment in just program delivery, whether it's in the city do it, can Boys and Girls Club do it, can the school district do it, and so that we create uh, more activity and value in these neighborhood parks. Yeah, including the ponds. I mean, we talked about the ponds too. Uh, you know, the Central Park, the Steinman's facility, you know, getting involved with DDC. Uh, and again, you know, I talked to Rich Paterni earlier today too. Uh, he's one of the members of the committee, I know. And uh, he's very energetic to get the committee going and start working. And uh, he was worried about, you know, having members from the different neighborhoods on the committee as well. I said, we well, you know, get too many. I think 11 is the maximum we can put on, I believe. Uh, or 12 maybe, or something like that. But I said, you know, what you want to do there is have your community forums. Go out to the parks. Go out to those neighborhoods and meeting with those neighbors associated and actually walking around the parks with them. Uh, so I think it's a good thing, it's, it's good enough, it's early enough right now for us to still get out there and take a look at, at these parks. Uh, again, if Ms. Ray over here in this uh, board field, if you're okay, we take a look and maybe start filling those slots uh, and even getting them to, uh, to meet uh, maybe early September and uh, really let's start making some road trips, as you call it, uh, to some of our neighborhood parks uh, throughout the city and see what we can put forward. Um, I believe the um Recommendations are from your office, is that correct, in the park? Uh, that particular board is solely my discretion to, to make the appointments. Again, I, uh, Rich Paterni and Tom Isabella agreed to kind of co-chair it and get it started, mm -hmm. uh, which has a uh, long time interest in uh, recreational activities in the community. Tom, uh, President of the City Council for a long time, chair of the uh, Parks and Recreation Committee. So they have uh, good working knowledge of the history of the parks, some of the good things that happened there. You know, also seen the uh, decline and some of the problems with it. So it's how do you, you know, as part of the revitalization of the city, uh, I want the parks to be part of that. I mean, before we started earlier this year, before we continuing that. So as I said earlier, it's really creating value for homeowners. Where it used to be people bought a house in the neighborhood, they would see the park as an asset. And that isn't really the case anymore. And so how do we go back and uh, get people to use the parks, take some ownership, and uh, make sure that they're uh, things that reflect well on everyone? So, Mayor, if um, someone's interested in serving, can they that maybe is not in the city, can you necessarily um, be aware of that was interested. Did they just submit the resume or contact your office? They could. Okay. 
And Mr. Kosher, you, you mentioned that maybe all the neighborhoods um, shouldn't be represented. Now, and, um, I know they all can, but I think that we should try to get um, people from different neighborhoods so that like everybody isn't from one particular neighborhood. So oh, you know, no, I agree 100% yeah. on that. I know we can't have, well, we could have 11 people. The legislature said that we may not want to, but I think we should still try to spread it around so that people reside in different parts of the city. Absolutely, there's no question yeah. about that. Yes, yeah, so another piece of the whole committee, too, and I don't know if it would fall under there or not, uh, Mr. Mayor, is the, um, the, the non regulation that we have in place for our vendors, our food vendors that are currently in our parks. Um, and Mr. Riggy was there, as, as well as the city clerk. Uh, we were there a couple of cases where we have vending trucks uh, next to Tiny Totland who were actually leaking vegetable oil, leaking regular motor oil out of the trucks right under our blacktop paved areas. We had gas generators going right next to Tiny Tot's playland. Uh, and the thing is, we, we, we really don't have these regulations in place anywhere. The county issued them permits, and so did we, obviously. Uh, I talked spoke with the county folks. They uh, issued them upon inspection of the vehicle early in the year. I mean, we saw the one truck. It was the guy who insisted it wasn't his truck leaking. I got down on my L fours and looked at it. It was coming right from the tire rod, just dripping like it was at the Beverly Hills coming out. You know, the black gold Texas tea. It was coming out. Uh, but it's, it's ruining our lots. It's ruining. Our, it was ruining our, our, our the facilities. And again, we had parents trying to use Tiny Top Land uh, with a gas generator going on. But I wonder if that was, is that something we can encompass into that committee as well? Take a look at some regulation, or is that something we would do out of our group, Parks and or the Health and Recreation Committee? Uh, we're just going to take a look at that. There's it, nothing there. Why do we all come to look at that? If I made aware of situations like that, there could be a remedy to the meeting. Yeah. So we're not going to go through committee cycles, we're not going to do stuff around. Right. Move along. Yeah, and they did do that. So, uh, so the, the city clerk was there, and deputy fire chief. We had them all down there, uh, and they did a great job. But again, their their question was, we don't have any regulations in place uh, for them to really well, look at. Um, that was the problem. Yeah. To make sure that people act in an affirmative manner that solves the problem. Very good. We have things in place to pull their um, lights in. That's, that, that's how we stopped them. Okay. I went up there and, right. and suspended their. Uh, the vendors from it. The, the, yeah. the law, the ordinances are there. Yes. It's just uh, the thing is we weren't aware of. Yes. We weren't aware of the problem. As soon as we were made aware of the problem, we went up there. Uh, and when people it was remedied. Do the applications for permits are granted. There's an assumption that they're going to act in a manner that reflects well on them, reflects well on the city. If they don't do that, we want to know about it, so we're going to take the appropriate action to remedy. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I actually heard from um, one of the vendors as well. And so when we, I guess this is really a question for Mr. Uh, Mr. Thorne, when we give someone a permit, do we designate where you can or cannot set up in the park? I mean, that, because apparently, yes. what, what Mr. Kozier is saying, they set up a place that just is, you know, maybe not conducive to the quality of using the park. So is there something specific that says, this is the area where you can vent from? There are six cannot. spots. There are six spots that Mr. Winkler designated in the park last year. They're numbered. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> There's only six vendors allowed in Central Park, uh, and each one gets a spot, and they're assigned that on their license. And is that what these current vendors are using? Or are they going outside of those six spots? As far as I, I I'm, I'm not enforcement. When I was up there, the day I was up there, the the two people were in the spots that okay. they were designated. Okay. Yeah, they certainly, and again, just to follow up, they were certainly in those areas that were marked off. I guess there was talking, Bill Mosaic was there as well. He was talking about possibly relocating them over by where the dumpster is now, in that area where it's not a main walkthrough uh, and it was more grassy area to set up. Because again, these trucks are, it was, if you walk through there, we had people falling and slipping there, you know, little kids. That's how they came to our attention because we were running the store camp at the other end and they came to us with one of the kids. And, uh, and I think, Mr. Ring, you were out of town, so no defense. I mean, you would have been my first call, you know that. I would call you at 6.30 in the morning with a complaint. But that's why I went to Chuck, and Chuck did a great job. And like I said, with the deputy chief down there and everybody. Uh, but yeah, it was just, it was leaking. No, was I'm clear on that. I just want to make sure that we're clear that the people were in the area they said, yeah. if there was a problem with their truck leaking, that becomes a different conversation. Yeah. But they weren't going outside of where they were designated yeah. to be. So, you know. yeah. They're clearly marked. They don't park park right personnel had, had spoke to them also, and, and the day that I went up there, the uh, the truck that you we discovered that was really leaking the oil, he wasn't there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I spoke to him later in that day, and the reason he wasn't there was because he was having a, a oil pan replaced. Okay. And 
I had him send me the, uh, the invoice to prove that the work was actually done. And so uh, that was taken care of. The other situation with the, uh, the generator, we just had him move from one side of the road to the other. But <clears throat> one of the things that our office did not know was there, there, are, six, um, there are six power stations up there that Bill Winkler had taken care of last year. And there's been vandalism to that. So <clears throat> initially, the, the thought was that these people could go in pay the city for power for much less than they're going to pay for gasoline for a portable generator uh -huh. and just plug it into the power. But apparently those stands were vandalized over the winter and my understanding from OGS is that it's going to be costly, number one, to repair them, but then they're also talking about putting some kind of a uh, reinforced cage around them so to keep the vandalism down. So. Were, were those okay, we would have never had the issue with the, uh, with the generator. The, the guy is paying something like $10 a day for gasoline, but we wouldn't charge him anything near that for, for the power that he would use. That's right. Actually, I'm saying 950. So, I guess it's not up. Very good. But I, to support Mr. Kozier's talk, a lot of this resulted from a lack of communication, and I think were a park committee involved, a lot of these dots would have been uh, connected much sooner, and it, I don't believe it would have come become the uh, the crisis the or the emergency it that it was. Mr. Riggie? Yes. Talking about the vendors, and I talked to Mr. Kozier about this, there's a lot of ambiguity on the vendors that vend ice cream on the city streets, and some reason the code is one of those things like the corporation. <laughs> I ran into it. it says it's the city engineer will designate. There's also only vent on secondary streets. So what's a secondary street? But what's a primary street? It's not because right now he's been vending on Campbell Avenue. Never since I lived on Campbell Avenue has the ice cream truck been allowed. But the man may have a point. Is that a secondary street or a primary street? Are we going to talk about? I thought the city engineer was. Uh, reissuing that list so it was clear. Well, I don't know if that's been done yet. I know that when I last checked, which I, I'm not sure how long it was. Well, was December comes more we'll authority, so yeah. that's for sure. But I mean, it is it is a danger because there's there is a lot of children. Just uh, if they want to cross, yeah, and to vet not camp. If it's just a priority on the camp, well, I guess that's okay. But I'm more concerned by the park. For the kids, yeah. yeah. By the kids. Yeah. The kids are running in and out. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Appreciate that. You're welcome. I do have one other thing that uh, I want to discuss under health and recreation. And another two parts, actually. Um, I think that everyone got the email from regarding Central Park and the children's playground there and um, the, the um, condition of the equipment, the sandbox with no sand, and you know, kids threw it out and never got replaced. So, um, I, you know, I, I responded to the email that it's something we were looking at all of the parts because we have, you know, we have things that need to be done in all the parts. So, um, just, I've encouraged this woman to continue to um, send the information, but um, I really think that in the winter, you know, starting, well, when the season's over, we should really, um, really consider what we do for the parts because now it's August and we're talking about concerns in the parts, which how was the conversation we had in maybe February so that when the park season opens, um, you know, we're ready. Um, so, you know, there's, and I don't know what we can do about swings. We, we have, we have Sutton's Park, which has several swings, um, and some of the equipment's not up to par. So what do we do about equipment that is not up to par that we can't replace this year? Is there a way that we, if, if that's brought to our attention, that those that equipment comes down so that no one gets hurt? Or how, how should that, would that be handled? Yes, if there's anything that's a hazard, we'll immediately take it out of service or some way secure it so that it doesn't create uh, an ongoing uh, potential for getting injured or liability on the city. Um, the, the other question is regards to Jerry Royal Park, and it's not, it, well, it, I guess how you look at it, it could become safety. Uh, the playground that was put in, um, the new playground has, the spill, or uh, I'm not sure what you call it, but the ground surface. 
So it really may now, you know, gets kicked away or carried away in different, in different ways. Is that like the mulch that was there? Yeah. yeah. And so it really needs to be replaced. Um, and there's a, there's a cost that's obviously uh, uh, associated with that. So the question was, is that something that we could consider doing this year? It's, I guess, relatively quick. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, those were and with these schoolers, because they actually partner with the county, and the county take, takes wood chips over there, clean wood chips, and they dump them there on a regular basis as well. So maybe we can, again, with this shared services thing with the county to uh, see if they would offer their wood chips. But that's all it is that you're talking about, because uh, I'm not so sure. But I know they do them in other schools. Uh, I'm not sure that. what the materials called. Yeah, they double check that. In regards to the sandbox, I actually replied to her as well. Uh, I think it was later than what you did, because uh, I saw your reply. And I could, um, going, going back to the schools, I was involved with all the PTOs. The reason that the schools doesn't fill their sandbox in is because the cats use it. The cats use those litter boxes. And there's exactly bingos, exactly. And my little kid is playing in that sandbox, and all of a sudden, they're not marbles in there. They're not a different thing. Guess what? Now we've got a whole different reaction from the cat. So I did tell her that, uh, that that might be a possibility. I said, you know, we could certainly take a look at, you know, the and say, go far about the reasons. But that's why, you know, again, the schools yeah, are fun. that I spoke to her too. But she yeah. said, well, we have cats in the sandbox, and the cats don't go in the sandbox. Oh, no. Maybe that's her cats. I don't yeah, know. The cats don't go in the sandbox. So it's an all that that's, 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 that's a health issue. Yeah. yeah, that's what I understand. Okay. So we all were just saw that. was good. We all were just talking about So as we're discussing this over the uh, winter season, we can think about whether we want sand in the sandbox. Well said. Kevin, get the fresh line. We're fresh stuff, so whatever that stuff is going <laughs> On, uh, with the equipment, maybe the Park Advisory Committee, I think we need an inventory of our equipment, what kind of shape it's in, and uh, what needs to be replaced, what shouldn't be replaced, what we don't need anymore if it is sandboxes. Mm -hmm. But what's come to my attention is tennis nets. I think we have them, but they were never put up at Elders Park, to the best of my knowledge. Is there a reason for that? Are you know, Mayor? I don't know. I don't know. Oh. And I think that's one of the things that uh, the Park Advisory Committee can look at. Yeah. Or something even before the season happens, as it was stated, to go around and look at all the parks and see what needs to happen so that before the season comes that people use the park, everything's in place. And we're not doing this again in August. Yeah, maybe get in our budget. You know, maybe get in our budget for this year, you know, for next year, for 2015. You know, capital improvements with the, with the roof and all that stuff. Just something that we can give to the mayor prior to, you know, bringing the budget to us. And I know we're already working on it, so it might be too late, but fast we can get this committee moving again up and, and just take a look at all this stuff. Makes some uh, good stuff. And I'm glad we're working on the parks. That's, that's, that's good yeah. stuff. So thank you for all your support and all that. Anything else from the Health and Second. All those in favor? Aye. We're adjourned. Thank you. Well, for the claims, citywide reassessment. Of course, Mr. I don't think we're going to executive session, so you don't have to leave. Free to do what you want. I want to leave. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we Unfortunately, Mr. Erickson resigned. This was something that he was interested in also. And the mayor, I defer to you coming back and hear your feelings um, on this issue. Yeah. Just uh, give a quick summary of my position. The assessment that uh, we all were working under the analyzed assessment study pretty much coincided with a peak in the market. And then we went into a period of decline and we're using the equalization rate 122%, 123%, which comes close to, I think, uh, reflecting this, but how do you level that out and put something in place that uh, is fair and accurate? The one thing that I want to do before we would consider the uh, reassessment or starting the process is to get the Section 108 line alone lined up to get the Attorney General in on Friday to the uh, press conference on the stuff with the land bank money coming in where we eliminate the worst of the worst blight but we get rid of the properties that have just such a negative impact on all our neighborhoods and some of these houses are in every neighborhood now, but no place is immune from it and depending on which study you look at you know, it's within 1,500 feet, it's within 2,000 feet. One of these properties decreases the value of everybody's house. So that if we can get move forward 
Illinois loan from the Attorney General. Uh, got some of the banks lined up who will put mortgages in here. It will get rid of the worst of the worst and start to create value. And I look at this, we're, we're doing the foreclosures now, and there are 240 some properties on the list. That number may vary a little bit in the last few days. But by getting rid of the worst of the worst, if you add $1,000 in value to each one of those houses as we sell it, that's just that much more money that the city will benefit from. And so I want to clean up some of the problems, uh, move down that path, continue down the path that we're going down. And we can start to look at the uh, reappraisal, the timing of it becomes a multi-year project, and then how do we line up the money to, again, be able to pay for it. My concern has been is the inequity in the assessment rule since a lot of people out this year. How many people were in the league of board assessment review? Just constantly. I don't know the number of that number is probably available. But I mean we have been granting a lot of tax certs, especially commercial properties, so that automatically skews the role no matter what happens, even if it evens out at some point. Where it gets spread out to everybody else that hasn't been granted relief, that has not been granted relief. So the role is skewed, and I think it's something that we have to address at some point. I mean, what's the time frame that you have in mind? Maybe because right now the role's really messed up as, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, anybody that's been granted relief is paying less and, and it's getting pushed over to those who haven't either grieved or, or went through the tax search or every process. So, that's a concern of mine uh, as far as fairness and the level of playing field. Given the initial time would be starting to look at how you pay for it in this budget side. So we're starting to lay the down for that. And then how do you actually do it? Do you do it all at once? Do you do it in a phased manner? And again, it still becomes a multi-year project. Even if everybody agrees and to start going forward today, just the reality of it, uh, it takes a couple of years. What, what, do you know the approximate cost to, um, to, to do it? Talk about the cost. Uh, I don't have the really good numbers, you know, what component we do in house, what do you have to contract out? And it becomes the timing of it so that the you know, data is pretty current, though, what you say? Do you think we'd have to collect data on these homes? That is uh, one of those we have an early impressive going to get it. Again, it is, in theory, pretty good. It's fairly current from the last one. And in some of the other projects we're doing, we're trying to automate. Building inspector, uh, it's got that in with uh, Troy, Schenectady, Amsterdam, uh, looking for the state to come in. So there is some component that we're going to do anyway, and it would be applicable to be used in a reassessment. It would also be used in our analysis and planning that we're doing now uh, for police, fire, and other. So it's all those things you get really a double hit by being able to do it together. And, and one other thing, if and when, when this happens, I think we really have to, on a yearly basis, update the, the assessment goal since it does change as markets pretty yeah. volatile up and down. And if we can do that, then I think we won't run into this big problem hopefully in the near future when this happens. Because that role, like you said, when it was done, it was at the peak of the market. Right after that, it tanked within a couple of years and it, it reached again and really got started to go. But if we can keep after it on it, I would think there's got to be a program that we can have that shows neighborhood sales in different neighborhoods. Different neighborhoods are going to be different on the sales of house and house springs. Because that can be plugged in and we can keep the role somewhere where they belong. 
hopefully, like a, my point is, if we do this again, which I think we have to at some point, I agree with the mayor, if we're going to at least start looking at the next budget process, that we can keep it up to date so we don't fall too far behind. So that is quite an issue with the assessor's office, the ability to do that. A lot of the information is manually maintained so that you get sometimes uh, the uh, inappropriate uh, application of uh, so authority within the office. You get uh, in just things that are very time consuming to put in place. And the kids, we get everything computerized, get it there so that it can be maintained in an accurate and fair manner. It works for everybody's advantage. Any other questions, comments? Just a question. So we're working towards computerizing it at this point? Well, my focus is this would be a very small component of that. We're working on a regional basis, really statewide, to get uh, our building inspector records uh, computerized, to get the entire housing uh, profile, say housing, all our property profiles available and accessible for other departments. The example I use when the fire chief go out the fire at 2 o'clock in the morning, they're getting there and they don't know who the homeowner is, they don't know building permits in an issue, they don't know issues with the property that is an incident commander, I believe they should know. They don't know police activity, other things. It's just one of my priorities to get in place systems that we can exchange information internally. In, uh, one of the things that uh, learned over this in New York State, and it's kind of my elevator pitch that I make to state legislators and other people I run into, is that New York State has very sophisticated data for police and fire, but building inspectors' data, uh, it is allowed to the discretion of the local building inspector and the information that is required by the state is at best superficial and there's really no analysis of that and what it seems to be is if we can do more detailed analysis of property uh, when it's starting to become distressed where people aren't paying their taxes you have a change in ownership some of the the grass is too long in front of the building the house we can deal with that early on, then we're not spending all the time and money on police and fire services five and six years down the road. But these distressed properties were the cost, uh, you know, estimates we have here in the city, they run over the lifespan from when you lose a good and productive ownership to the city is cleaning up the mess. It costs about $60,000 a parcel. So where you have potential of uh, a thousand of those properties, and understand the magnitude that we're dealing with. That's why our uncollectability is up and actually it's gone down. It's such a big component of our tax revenue stream. People just aren't paying the taxes. We're spending all the money in the wrong direction. And rather than coming to council saying we're going to spend it doing these programs and equipments in the park the paving streets for positive things, as opposed to keeping the mandate and maintaining uh, the distressed property. Any okay, just before we uh, recess, I sent a memo off today. I don't know if you got a copy or not. Yeah, I know Mr. Wood of Aaron and you have asked for a little more information on dangerous dog alerts. I think everyone else has got one. Yes. Now, I talked to you before about this matter. This is something you could probably do it administratively, correct? Is this the real link? No? Is this the real link? What are you asking me to do? To place if there's a dangerous dog owner uh, that we place online on our webpage. Or are these dogs have own registration? 
without registration. Is this the No, I'm not. I'm bringing it up on the claims. Claims? Yeah. The Kevin Clark over this. Well, excuse me a minute. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out. This could come out under claims at some point. Like, the dog say somebody with those two dogs that would be held safe. It could come out anybody else. Well, because I was told it was going to be on, and it wasn't on, that's why I'm bringing it up. Well, it's not on our agenda, so. But you can be excused if you'd like, Mr. Kroger. The fundamental issue here is we had a horrific event with what I believe you're asking for here, or asking me to do, would not address that situation. Because the incident that created the status originally for that to be designated, or those dogs to be designated as dangerous animals, occurred outside of this jurisdiction. Where, again, Mr. Tedesco put out a proposal, and I will again reiterate that the motivation for that seems to be more for headlines than correcting the problem. I don't believe you made any inquiries with the Office of Court Administration. There's nothing with the state police. Even there was a subsequent release that went out last Thursday or Friday criticizing me. Or it's just it's a press release. That's what it looks like. That's what it looks like. I want to move away from that. I'm looking to have it where a dog is sighted, to have it on our website. So if a person's, let's put these two dogs out of the picture. Let's say it's another dog that lives on Campbell Avenue. I want to know when I'm walking down Campbell Avenue if there could be a dog that's been sighted for being aggressive. We do have that. We do have a database, don't we? Right, and that was put together today. There's, I think, six or four dogs from this year. So can they be put up on our city website where they're located? What are you asking for, the location of it? I just as soon see it. I know you want to see it more specific. I want it identified for a particular house. And again, it's not the remedy. The Office of Court Administration has that information. And so I want to get into this local debate of kind of a gotcha politics or press coverage. But counsel, I'll tell you that. We can do it. It's readily available on an ongoing basis. And in fact, most of the events that I can remember have all been very detailed reports in the press, local newspaper and television coverage, where we've had these incidents with dogs. And again, they are horrific when you go through it. The fundamental and first thing that we've been doing is the more aggressive campaign to get the dogs licensed. And there's some hesitation on the counsel to move ahead for that when that was first proposed. We're now doing that, and we're seeing some of those results. If you look at the numbers from 2011, 2012, they're down. 2013, they're down. They seem to be lower this year. So we're moving in the right direction. And it's to hold people accountable. And the problem is not the dogs. It's the owners. It's the owners. And it's so to like that. But the owners aren't biting people. You know, it's the dogs that are biting us. Correct? Yes. So are you OK with releasing that information? If you want to release it to me personally, that's OK. I'll put it on. I'll make my own page, whatever you want to do. We can do that. But if you ask me to release the information that's already out there, so again, it's more theatrics than the stuff of substance. I don't think so. I think it's a link that we can put on our own web page, our city web page, so people can click on it. It can be advertised, and people can click on it so they know without having to search anywhere else. And that does not address the fundamental problem of making that available so that you have people who may be in one jurisdiction get cited and then move someplace else. They were cited in our jurisdiction also, weren't they, those dogs? Yes, for this last incident. Yeah. Well, the incident before, which we didn't get to. I thought there was an incident before that, but there were two incidents before that as well. I understand. There was one. I think there was two. Well, Mayor, in keeping with that, could we, you know, because we 
know, Mr. Coach, you talked a lot about each of the municipality agreements. Is there some way that we could, our surrounding municipalities, you know, agree with our the police department or their dog enforcement or whatever the other one has that when it happens to a jurisdiction that's extremely close to us, that they could, you know, let us know? So, well, this is what we're doing. We're having the Center for Technology and Government come in and do part of the study we focus that we're using is on the code enforcement data. But it would create a platform so that all of this information would be available. So that you could put whether people pay their taxes, uh, whether there's other code violations there, whether they have a dangerous dog. Uh, and that becomes uh, a much more functional uh, database so that when you integrate the police and fire data, then you can manage the problems and you can better set public policy. So we're, I've been working on a much bigger global solution and really helping set a statewide agenda for, again, that data management where this will be a very small component in where I think this year we're at four. Yeah, I, I agree with the mayor as well. It, it should certainly be a statewide registry. We're looking to do something. It can't just be the city's going to be taking the lead because, again, this database could be as outdated as within two or three months, Mr. Reed. I mean, our folks within within city, they move from property to property on a regular basis, unfortunately. And let's just say we have 1311 Campbell Avenue where the dog will reside. Those folks might move two months down the road. Who, are you going to be obligated to report to the mayor's office or to whoever that you have now moved and your dog has moved to 9 Nassau Avenue? Well, how do we do it when we register dogs then? Maybe next year with the ones that Mr. Thorne are registered, yeah. they can move too. We yeah, see, I, I don't even, and that's, I don't even know if that's in there. I mean, if I move and my dog is licensed, incidentally, off the of record, we are we are licensed, uh, but is there a requirement where I have to call the city to tell them they're moving? And I think it becomes a liability issue on the city's part as well. If we're saving that we have a vicious dog at 9 Nassau Avenue and all of a sudden I have moved and now 9 Nassau is now somebody else is residing there. Uh, I just think it's got to be a statewide initiative and, and I really, or even on a countywide basis, you wouldn't be countywide, but there's just so much liability issue here, I think, involved with this. And uh, it's just more than just the city taking a lead. I didn't want it specific. The mayor yeah. wants it specific. I just want to say it's on Nassau Avenue. Yeah. That's all I want. That's all I ask for from yeah. the beginning. But if I move, I move, and then my dog's not, we're not there anymore. Yeah. But I'm saying it's not a good address. Yeah. If you have the general, then people are suspicious of everything on the street. Yes. Where as opposed to actually identifying who the problem is. Yeah. You think everybody, some streets are fairly short, some streets are very long, it creates, I think, a lot of pressure. Yeah. I think someone can come out with some statewide and we'll certainly jump on the bandwagon and think that if something well, happens. Well, that proactive. I would love to I guess that's it. not going to happen. Well, I would that's love to do that. Well, um, I'm not sure that we necessarily should wait for statewide. Because I'm thinking back to the woman who was walking at you know whatever time in the morning. So I, tomorrow morning we will put the four. Uh, I believe it's four instances that yeah. happened in the last year up on the city website and city's connected. And I think that's it's reasonable. Good. Yeah. You know, Jim has really been one of the least effective state legislators of the entire legislative body. You look at why. Our state aid is so low. Uh, he's only was dumped as minority leader. Uh, he's looking for cheap headlines. That's what he's done. And it's part of the ethics that functions in uh, the state government why they're so efficient. My only concern is for public safety for yeah. business. And that's mine, too. I don't want to get into the politics. You can blast assembly and Tedesco all you want, Mayor. I'm interested. This is me that's talking, not Jim Tedesco. I'm talking. That lady, you saw the pictures of that dog, and it's heartbreaking. So if we can save just one dog from that happening to I think it's worth it. What's the big deal? Put it up on the website. This is a rocket scientist stuff we're asking for. That's all. I told you, we'll put the four, I believe it's four, oh, it's right. to go up. It will not solve the problem. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to bring up a separate topic, just as a general statement. Um, last week, very quickly before, we, we have a pile of property in Bellevue um, that I think we've all been working on, but I, I would like to ask everyone on the council that um, we refrain from using specific addresses. I just don't think that's fair. Um, the specific 
address that came up. But when we have a problem property or when we have people complaining about um, a property or we're citing a property or whatever, I don't think it's fair to the homeowner to use a specific address um, if it's being tended to. So just trying to remind everybody that. We have, but that's what I mean. But I don't know. To me, it's just not. I just want to kind of throw it out there in general because, I mean, for people, other people's quality of life, say the person made a mistake or whatever, and now they're, you know, I, mean, I just think it's a good practice to keep aware of um, when we're announcing those. Anything else? For claims, entertain a motion to recess. Second. Oh, yeah. All right. Aye. Aye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.